very pleased to have Margaret Crook from Harvard, where she's an associate professor, professor of global health. She studies health systems, including the quality in health systems and the effects of that on the demand for health care, population health, and confidence in the system. And she is the chair of the Lancet Global Health Commission on High Quality Health Systems in the Sustainable Development Goal era. This is a tremendously important topic, and we're very lucky and pleased to have someone who can speak to us so authoritatively on it. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you, colleagues, for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure to be back in sunny San Francisco from frigid Boston. Um, delighted to, to be with you to talk about um, this, I think, really important uh, theme that I've actually been hearing throughout the day today, which is that the substrate of everything we've been talking about, all of those interventions, all of those fabulous technologies, uh, the way that those things work is uh, by uh, working in functional health systems, by being placed in functional health systems. And so I'm here um, with you today to get beyond the intervention, expand our viewpoint, and uh, provoke, I hope, a little, uh, inform a little bit as well uh, about some of the work we've been doing to understand health system quality, health systems is the base of health improvement. Um, so first, I just want to uh, introduce a little bit the Lancet Global Health Commission because many of the results that I'll be presenting to you today come from that commission. Um, and this was a, a, a two-year effort to define um, quality, actually, define health system quality, and describe it in low- and middle-income countries, a sort of epidemiology of quality, if you will. Uh, we wanted to talk about measurement, how do you measure this really complicated thing, and also uh, rethink improvement. So as you can imagine, this was really only 20% of my time. That's what I think Google the grant paid for, but of course it took over my life in its entirety. But it did result in this report here on the left that was published last September, and I welcome um, all of you to, uh, to download that. Um, this is our commissioners, 30 commissioners from 18 countries. One of the first uh, critical questions that arose uh, in this work is how, do, uh, how does somebody at Harvard <laughs> sitting in Boston critique an entire world's uh, set of health systems? That's obviously not on. Um, and in fact, that's not the starting point for this inquiry. Uh, we really um, recognize from the beginning that looking under the hood of health systems, whether that be in this country, in Canada where I come from, and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa where I've worked for, for a long time. Um, it's a joint effort, and it has to be an effort in which there is local investment in a very deep way and, and, uh, and um, uh, a local commitment to change. So we have uh, 30 commissioners um, from 18 countries, and only a handful are, in fact, academics. Because uh, as I thought about formulating the commission, it occurred to me I know where to find academics. I'm good at that. Um, but I'm, I have less direct connection with um, health system policymakers, uh, with people who make big decisions, with people who allocate funds, and they really need to know about health systems. So having their input was actually critical to uh, keep us academics grounded. Um, we were also extremely fortunate to have a brilliant team of, uh, of uh, students, doctoral students, postdocs, uh, analysts, that really allowed us to look at the data uh, with, uh, with a lot of energy and, and uh, with infinite energy, really, because this team just kept, kept on going. Um, so this is the equation that motivated the work, um, which is this, that the value proposition, I've heard that term a few times today, too, that the core value of a health system to the population is a very straightforward equation, which is that if you use us, if you use these services, we will provide them with sufficient fidelity, with sufficient quality, that you will be able to get better health. Now, for some of us in the room who practice medicine, you know, you look at this and say, if we produce health in maybe 20% of our interactions, and the rest, we, we certainly hope for adherence, we have their long-term you know, issues, many conditions are self-limiting. That's all true. So if we just substitute the probability of health and increase probability of health, I think this equation holds. I do not think that very many of us would choose to spend the time and the expense and the effort to go to a clinic to get anything other than an increased probability of health, all right? Um, just like we don't go to the hairdresser for a manicure, we go to the health system for health. Um, and so this is, I think, what the health system needs to consider as it, uh, as it uh, plans its work and as it asks for funds as well. 
Um, and so that's the equation. And uh, the contention that we started the commission with is that all of the focus, all of the action, all of the the, the, the emphasis in global health has been on the U part of the equation. Utilization has been extremely heavily uh, subsidized, pushed, um, measured, uh, uh, really emphasized um, throughout uh, certainly the last 30, 40, even longer, 50 years. With the, I think the notion that if we can get people to clinic, we can get people to the vaccine, to the medication, to the provider, job done. Right? They're going to get the care and they're going to get better. And so what I want to share with you is this slide. It's just one of many that could be constructed along these lines in which we identified countries that have achieved 90% coverage of skilled delivery. So these are women who are essentially in these countries, nearly all women are delivering their baby in the safe setting, in the place that should be able to save their and their baby's life. Um, and what we did is we divided them. We had a lot of feedback from reviewers. It's been a, this is a very contentious set of issues we're actually tackling, um, it turns out. Uh, but anyhow, one of the comments was, well, maybe let's divide these countries up into income categories. So you have your low-income countries on the far left, low middle in the middle, and upper middle over on the right. And what I'm showing you on the y-axis, I think this is the slide with the newborn, yeah. So, um, but we can construct this for different outcomes. Um, newborn mortality is the, is the height of the bars. And you can clearly see, and by the way, the red line is the sustainable development goal for newborn mortality, which is 12. You can see here that simply having everyone deliver in a health clinic in no way guarantees survival for the newborn. Um, so it isn't the case that you by itself causes health. It has to be the combination. And uh, we uh, further think, and, um, and it struck me that um, Quality, and this again question has come up already, that quality is going to be all the more important a consideration in health systems and in our, all our work in global health going forward compared to looking back because of the, at least these three factors. Factor one, we have more and more complex health needs now showing up at the, at the door of the health system. Um, this is a list of uh, indicators for the sustainable development goal target on health. Sustainable Development Goal 3 is no longer just about maternal and child health and infectious disease, right? It's about all of these things, all of these things. So more, more conditions, more complexity. Um, second is the point here that's already been raised, that residual mortality. We've been incredibly successful. I am completely with Dean. It's been an era of unprecedented success, I would say. Uh, I, I, you're absolutely right that the line of mortality reduction far outstrips anything that could be explained by income or education or other things alone. Definitely medical technology has made a huge difference, um, but we are at a different point now. As a result of those gains, we're at a different point in the epidemiologic transition such that the next set of gains are going to require different sorts of inputs, different orientation of the health system. And then the last point is rising expectations. Um, I was in Kenya two weeks ago with the Ministry of Health, uh, the First Lady's Office, who are all parts of members of this commission, active members of the, of the commission. And we were having this discussion about how Kenya's health system was built up for a post-colonial world with post-colonial political goals, right? What were those goals? It was to d take the health care that was concentrated for settlers in, in urban areas and distribute it as widely as possible throughout the country to the entire population. Now, that, was all, that made sense at that time when there were three or four or five things that those health centers did for people. And they were largely episodic, uh, fairly effective care. A lot of very basic health promotion and prevention was, was getting done as well. But the system that Kenyans have today, that system that was inherited, hasn't changed, by the way, in, in the 50, I guess 60 years since, <laughs> since independence. Um, and yet the conditions are vastly different. Right? Some of the highest NCD, 80% of NCD mortality today, 80% of global NCD mortality is in low and middle income countries. Right? It's one of the top causes of death already in India and other parts of the world, and soon to be that way in sub-Saharan Africa as well. So not the system, that, the system was not built for those conditions. Um, so let's go to the, um, the findings of the commission. And I want to uh, put out there, um, I think, four cognitive errors that we have been making in the broader global health enterprise, in thinking about interventions, in thinking about quality and costs um, that I think emerged to me from the work of the commission that I'd love your thoughts on. Okay, so first we undertook to redefine um, high quality health systems, beginning with the proposition that health systems are first and foremost for people, 
they've been treated as uh, technical sort of technical uh, um, uh, products in a way or services that are uh, that are going to be organized and planned by by uh, technocrats um, with a little help from their economist friends and that people should be grateful to get them uh, but actually that's not how it works. We should be thinking about health systems as fundamentally a service sector provision uh, of goods and, and services. They are for people, um, and that high quality health systems job is to do at least three things. One is to consistently deliver care that can improve or maintain health. So promotion is a critical piece. Prevention is a critical piece. Uh, by uh, generating value and engendering trust in the population, um, I think at this moment, when we're seeing uh, Ebola centers being attacked, when we're seeing cl large clusters of our own populations not vaccinating children, perhaps the value of trust is, is a little clearer than it would have been even a few years ago when we talk about this. But it's absolutely essential for systems to engender trust, um, as well as to change. A good system is a, a system that changes, that adapts to the changing needs and preferences of the population. It cannot be static. And I would, uh, I would say that, I think, again, I think a, a mistake we've been making is of thinking of these health systems as forever systems. These clinics, the way that they are and the things that they provide, that's how it's forever going to be because that's how it's been. Uh, I think it's time to rethink that. Um, this is the framework that we came up with. You will, those of you familiar with uh, previous frameworks of health systems will note that we've uh, reduced the real estate available to the inputs in the health system. We put them at the bottom because we think that things like population, governance, platforms, workforce, and tools are truly the foundations of a system. But as I'm going to show you in a moment, they don't actually determine the quality or the outcomes of work, of, of, the, of the gains in that system, the health gains in that system by themselves. They're necessary but not sufficient. And so we really want to put them as the, as the core foundations of a system. Where the system should be measuring performance, where people should be holding the system to account, is on the top two areas, which are the processes of care and the quality impacts. Competent care and competent systems are two such areas, and another one is positive user experience. And then on the impact side, obviously better health, including patient reported outcomes, uh, better confidence, uh, and economic benefits that we're all very familiar with. We know that there are intrinsic benefits to being healthier, there are uh, income benefits to being healthier, productivity benefits, and others. So all of those belong very much to the health system performance assessment uh, function. Um, and around this framework, you'll see the values, because health systems are fundamentally an expression of values. I just saw Richard Horton's back at the Lancet after some, some weeks of illness, unfortunately, but hopefully he's, he's all better, uh, writing about the morality of health systems, the fact that actually values underpin everything. It's a social construct, health systems, right? Um, it's an agreement that we are looking after each other. And what is found inside the clinic is an excellent signal to the population about the strength and the content of that social contract. And so some of the values that we listed here are equi um, equity, resilience, efficiency. So it's not that we're against costs. We don't think that efficiency is the fundamental driving uh, goal of a health system. It is an important feature of a health system, certainly a decision point, but not the goal. Um, and of course, the people, the people focus. All right, so let's get to some numbers. Um, when we looked at the, um, the, the health benefits of a good quality health system, we, we looked at the uh, mortality that could have been averted from treatable conditions um, had such systems ex existed. So what we did here is um, we compared the case fatality rates for sustainable development goal diseases, and those are by definition conditions that 190 countries have agreed they can tackle. So we're not including, including pancreatic cancer here. Nobody can, can actually treat very well in, in any place, although improving, hopefully. Um, and from, for those treatable conditions, um, 61 of them. We looked at uh, the 137 countries that are currently in the low and middle income um, category by the World Bank, and we looked at the, uh, the excess mortality for most conditions in those countries by age sex groups, disaggregated by age sex groups, of course, because the population uh, distributions are quite different. Um, and then we found this number, which is 15.6 million deaths, which is the total of the left uh, pie chart there. And we felt that can't be right. That's a lot of deaths. And of course, when we step back and thought about it, many of those deaths were uh, from conditions which shouldn't have occurred in the first place. They should have been primarily prevented, right, through public health, through better roads. And so it didn't seem fair to give the health, the health system all of the 15 million. 
So what we then did is we subtracted out the excess incident conditions, the conditions that were that were present in excess compared to other countries that have good public health measures. And that's how we got the 7 million preventable deaths. So really an important, important area of work as well, of course, public health and pre primary prevention. But of the remaining, um, the remaining deaths then should be considered amenable, meaning they would have happened even with good promotion and prevention. 8.6 million deaths. Uh, we then applied utilization figures from, from uh, nationally representative surveys of all sorts. We aggregated every survey ever. We have the largest survey database now of, uh, of, of, of population-based use and health surveys. And what we found was that if you applied utilization patterns that were typical in the countries uh, under study, you would find that about 60% of the amenable mortality was happening among people who would be using the health system, who were using um, the health system. Now, this is highly modeled. Obviously, these are not the same people. This is a, a very big modeling exercise. These should be seen with caution, these data, as really indicative, not as precise. But the main point here is not, is it 5 million, is it 4 million, is it 6 million, but rather that it's a very large chunk of the amenable mortality is happening among people who took our advice and went to the clinic, and they didn't survive, right, for treatable conditions. When we looked at um, how this distributes across different conditions, because of course all of this was added up condition by condition, uh, we find that cardiovascular disease, newborn death, TB, road injuries, chronic respiratory, it's actually all across the board. For most of the conditions, quality, poor quality plays a very large role in excess mortality. Um, there are some conditions where we have such low utilization. I'm looking at cancer or mental health in low-income countries, right? Such low utilization that you can't blame it on poor quality. But if you just do the thought exercise and people do come to the health system today that are not coming forward, I think what we would see is not more survival, but more of this mortality due to poor, to poor access converting to poor quality deaths. Um, and of course, mortality is one very, very important outcome. Uh, we all care about it. It's easy to measure and, and a, a clearly a sentinel outcome. But another one is the economic, uh, economics of poor quality health systems. And there's been a number of estimates, including one by John Mira's team, who was a member of our commission, um, that looked at uh, uh, estimates like six trillion in economic welfare losses, looking at broad measure of income um, per year. There's beyond the premature mortality costs, there are of course uh, uh, waste costs, harmful care, unnecessary harmful care, and there's catastrophic expenditures, which are their own kind of economic harm that comes from poor quality care. What I mean with the last one is people often keep seeking care when it's ineffective, they keep coming back. Um, all right, so now let's, so that was an outcome um, target or an outcome number that I just showed you, health outcomes, right? Seeing huge um, excess mortality, uh, greater than the mortality due to TB, HIV, and malaria combined. Um, so then we wanted to look more at the process as the left side of that framework to say, what's actually getting done for people? Why is this mortality um, so high? And uh, here we are showing you the best data that we could aggregate, um, which are gold standard data. So these are data f f uh, gathered from clinical observations of care, where someone stands in the corner of the room, watches what happens in the healthcare visit, and, and checks it off a list. Um, so the immediate, I hope for those of you studying methods and, and survey methods, you'd be saying, oh, that's a lot of Hawthorne effect. So please look at these dots of performance and imagine that this is the best performance because it's observed performance, right? Um, so what do we find there? that health providers for even the most common conditions that we've been treating, that they've been treating for 50 years or more in those countries, we're seeing less than half of the recommended clinical actions done in a visit uh, for family planning, for sick child care, antenatal care, always does better than sick child care, right? For, again, physicians in the room, you would agree this is a very routine set of tasks with very little clinical judgment, whereas sick child care requires a lot more uh, cognitive effort and knowledge. Um, okay. Uh, so when we look now, that's, that's actually observed care processes. When we look at which treatments that are known and effective um, are provided to people who need them, we see huge, huge spread of performance. Um, and again, uh, a vast under-provision of effective treatment at the same time as there's over-provision of ineffective treatment. So colleagues of mine at, at Harvard are, are writing a paper right now looking at malaria over-treatment, vast malaria over-treatment. Why? Because behavior patterns which taught all providers in sub-Saharan Africa that every fever is malaria, haven't abated despite rapid diagnostic testing. Humans are hard to change. So there's uh, poor treatment for the wrong conditions. There's under-treatment when clearly uh, uh, antibiotics and other, other simple treatments are indicated. 
Um, I just want to uh, point out the depression point. We struggled mightily in the commission to find any data on mental health, on cancer, on injury, and emergency care, um, surgical quality. There's actually more data on that now, thanks to uh, people like uh, uh, Hailey DeVos, Sarah McFarlane, uh, colleagues in the DCP, and, and others. But um, look at depression. This is people who are um, uh, in care who are getting minimally adequate treatment. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's non-existent. Uh, health care, uh, quality care for mental health in lowest income countries is non-existent, but as far as we can tell. Um, okay, so that was uh, competent care, and now moving to patient experience, we see that approximately one-third of patients experience disrespectful care, short consultations, poor communication, or extremely long wait times. So um, two features of, of um, uh, user experience that we investigated are customer service on the one hand, right, just being treated decently uh, in the, by the receptionist, and second is the respect that you get from the provider, and are you heard um, as your viewpoint taken into account. So those are complementary pieces. And again, we see uh, data all over the place. These are very heterogeneous. There are multiple data sources here. I will just say that the red dots, one of the questions I often get when I present these, is people say everybody fetches in every country. People you know, have some problem with their provider. They don't get long enough and so on. Um, and that's true to some extent. There are complaints about health systems in every place. Uh, but the data in the red dots are from high-income countries. I mean, you do, you do see a different um, set of reactions to, to the health care provision, the interpersonal care that people get, and usually those, um, those uh, ratings are much better. Um, what else I want to say about this? Probably nothing. Okay, um, so the next uh, issue is the one of competent systems. I've talked about competent care providers, essentially providers knowing what to do, user experience, and then there's this um, issue that with this, this area that we wanted to elevate through the commission, which is the notion of competent systems. What I mean by this is this is the, the connective tissue of the health system. The system that can get you from one visit to the next, that can follow up, that reacts in, in response to a particular diagnosis in a particular way. This is longitudinality of care. This is safety of care, prevention. Essentially, everything that takes more than a single clinician to accomplish, right? It takes a system to accomplish. So when we look down the list of some of these statistics, I want to hone in on um, uh, timely action for a moment. Incredibly hard to measure, incredibly important for reducing that excess mortality in two ways. For emergent conditions, good treatment offered half an hour too late is useless, right? And for some chronic care conditions, again, good, right, correct treatment delayed by a few weeks means that the prognosis uh, deteriorates uh, dramatically. So timeliness is such a basic concept, um, very hard to measure. We had very little data other than from large studies, which is what we cite here. Um, just look at the data on femur fractures. Um, uh, the average wait time from admission to surgery uh, was, was uh, 11, 12 days in three countries with, with large studies versus half a day. Uh, this is just completely unacceptable for health systems to be treating folks in this way. Um, and then when we did an equity disaggregation, uh, you probably, again, won't be shocked to see these uh, figures. Again, here we're following in the footsteps of giants like Cesar Victoria and others uh, in maternal and child health, which have long been looking at equity distributions of coverage, right, of utilization. Here we're looking at quality. What do poor people get? So in the same countries, the poorest quintile, which here is the darkest blue, and um, is, is doing worse than the richest quintile, really across most conditions, although there are some areas in which uh, there is some, some, some very little uh, equity uh, signal in terms of quality um, of care. Okay, so those are just some findings to whet your appetite. We have 25,000 more words to describe those in the, um, in the Lancet report. Um, but let me just provoke with some, some insights and some challenges that I am, I, I am still chewing on. The commission was just the start in some ways um, because one of the main findings of the commission was the data are so poor, that the evidence base is so weak on some of the fundamental questions about how we move forward from these findings uh, that I'm here to share some of my frustrations with you and, and hopefully get your insights. So the first uh, cognitive finding that we identify in the commission um, is this notion of um, the system as a linear throughput device. You know, you put in resources into it and you get a, some kind of performance. Um, I'm citing uh, some, some uh, figures here from a paper 
in which we looked at sick child care. Um, on the x-axis is facility readiness, what WHO calls facility readiness, which is the stuff in the facility. Do they have everything they need to provide good sick child care? On the y-axis is observe provider performance in those same facilities. Right? Um, the average correlation was 0.1. Um, there's very high correlation in Namibia, which we have yet to work out exactly. And Namibia is a, is a very interesting health system, uh, which is, which is uh, perhaps not representative of the others. But what we are basically able to say, just look at the scatter of performance. Let's just look at Tanzania here, scatter of performance in even well-equipped facilities. Equipment does not guarantee performance is one thing I'd like you to walk away with today. Therefore, it is not a good measure of performance. We've got to stop counting drugs in cabinets and calling that health system performance. Um, and the way that we looked at this a little further is we, we wanted to say within facilities with the, same, with the same equipment, even within the same provider, how, how are these providers doing in terms of uh, caring for sicker versus less sick kids? So is our facility, if facilities were the, the um, um, ultimate uh, sort of constraint there, we would see large swings in what's done for sicker kids in poorly equipped facilities versus not. But here we're controlling for equipment, and what we find is that it's not about the equipment. It's about the provider and what they're, what they're able to do, what they're able to diagnose. This is the average number of care elements um, provided for a sick child. A child that we categorize as less sick, maybe this child had a fever or a runny nose or a cough. Um, and this is how many items uh, were done out of a total, I think this was a total of uh, uh, 18 in this particular study, maximum 18. Um, and so then what we did is we, we, we compared that to how many items were done for children who were more sick. By more sick, we mean children who had convulsions or were not keeping any food down for the last 24 hours. And this is the only additional effort that was made for those children in those health systems. So what does that tell you? It is telling me that differential diagnosis skills, the ability to segregate sick from well, which is the fundamental thing that family doctor learns in training, um, is not in evidence in many countries where we have very, very high mortality. Um, furthermore, in that same study, we found that the amount of care, the number of these clinical items, by the way, when I say clinical items, I'm talking about like weighing the child or giving a diagnosis or asking a history item, uh, those sorts of things which are taken from WHO guidelines, the number of items, care items, is strongly associated with client knowledge when they walk out, the mom's knowledge about what to do for her child, and also the satisfaction of that parent walking out of that visit, as is the duration of the visit. And one thing I didn't, um, I neglected to mention earlier is, uh, that we cited in the commission was there was a lovely systematic review of the length of primary care visits throughout uh, um, low-income countries. Any guesses what's the average length of a primary care visit in a low-income country? Yeah. What did you say, sorry? Four oh, you're so close. Yeah? Two minutes? Oh, you guys are very pessimistic. <laughs> six minutes, six minutes, uh, but, you know, very, very wide uh, spread there. In our study, in this study where we had timed visits, um, so remember, this is the Hawthorne effect, you know, everybody's being watched. These are eight-minute visits. Even under observation, all these providers could pull off as an eight-minute visit. <laughs> um, okay. Right. And so, um, so what we're saying is that you can't measure the foundations as a measure of performance. One more time. Foundations are not a measure of performance. They are a management measure. Or as one of our colleagues from the health ministry said, they're like a back office function. The costs, the people, the platforms, the, those tools, they're basic management inputs. They are not to be used, confused with performance. And that's not such, so strange when we think about business or really any other sector. And yet in health, what have we been reporting all along as health system development measures is these things, right? All right, so what should we be measuring instead is um, at least these four areas that we see as being hugely undermeasured. So health, health outcomes, particularly health system sensitive outcomes, things like perioperative survival, things like newborn mortality, maternal mortality, TB survival, many of those conditions that are very highly contingent on health systems. In addition, competent care in systems, people's confidence, and the experience that they have in their health care. And when you can put those measures together, what then you can arrive at is cascades of care, which our colleagues in HIV so thoughtfully develop, but actually which can be applied to all sorts of conditions to help health 
system managers identify where their health systems are losing fidelity, where they're dropping off. And this is, by the way, one of the benefits of having had so many policymakers on the commission. They pushed back when we talked about measurement. They said, this is boring. We can't do it. There's 2,000 of these measures. What should we be focusing on? And we said, well, how about you compile some care cascades across sentinel conditions, communicable, non-communicable, mental health, cancer, a bunch of these, and let's see where your system is losing strength. All right. Um, and then what we uh, further um, uh, recommended and what we're working on with the government of Ethiopia right now is to put this all together into a health system quality dashboard, which would be readily understood by the population, not just by uh, technocrats, uh, and which would report on the most meaningful measures um, annually, ideally, uh, transparently, on cell phones, et cetera. Error two, believing that users are passive. Um, so I'm a fan of discrete choice experiments and I'm glad to hear Elvin uh, using those again in, in, in HIV. Uh, but you know, um, we, um, we found that in Ethiopia, Ethiopia, this is not the most heavily endowed country in terms of health systems. It's not like women in rural areas have a thousand choices, but even there, when women were surveyed at health facilities, they acknowledged, one in three, that this was not their nearest facility. They sought this facility out by choice, thinking it was better. Um, and that when we did a discrete choice experiment saying, where would you deliver if you had the choice of a health system delivery, we found that they would deliver where there's a respectful provider, where there were available drugs, where, um, it, but the last thing that they wanted to do is to be delivered by a community health worker. So again, I've heard this theme throughout today. It's using the, the level of the system and the health provider in a way that matches people's preferences and understanding. Uh, and frankly, the, the healthcare indication, the health extension worker would not be the best choice for delivering someone. Users are not passive. They're making choices all the time, including the choice not to use the health system, not to stay in care. And we have to figure out why and where the health system plays a role in that. We, let's look at India uh, with a huge burden of non-communicable um, disease, diseases and particularly hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Um, this is the proportion of people in states where we had data that bypassed their nearest, they knew where the nearest clinic was, they just wouldn't bother going there. Because that clinic, that primary care clinic, uh, is for maternal and child health. It doesn't have anything to do with my disease. And so this is a health system that is woefully out of date for what its population needs, right? In high-income countries, 80%, 70% of NCD needs are taken care of by primary care docs. Maybe this country is an exception, but most other countries. And in uh, India, it's the, the exact opposite. Most of those patients with routine hypertension are going to hospitals. Um, and then we get qualitative data that look like these um, quotes, and there are many, many more. And it's really been, um, uh, I think, really important for research to come out, qualitative research, conveying the voice of patients. We in the commission published a, a, um, a, a complimentary uh, people's voice report that was, that was uh, organized by, by patient groups um, as well as the technical report. Um, but it's, it's not enough to say, oh, just give it to the population, ask them for feedback, because we also see data like, like these data, which is that patients don't expect enough today, that their expectations possibly have been blunted by the very low levels of care they've experienced, plus there are issues of low education, information asymmetry, and, and many others that essentially mean that our consumers are insufficiently demanding of the health system. This in front of you is a vignette that we gave in 12 countries, an internet sample in which we described this care by, that Anthony gets for his hypertension, where the nurse is nice enough, but she doesn't check his blood pressure. She doesn't ask his symptoms before check, uh, changing his blood pressure meds. This is, this is not good care, right? And yet, majorities of respondents in these 12 countries called this good, very good, or excellent care. Right? So we have four more vignettes, a paper on this is coming. But just to show you that actually starting with this already gives us important insight about where we need to start working. People need to know what to expect. And um, the government of South Africa has done a very clever thing on this front. For example, it's texting pregnant women now ahead of a particular visit that they're going to have for antenatal care that these are the three things you should get out of this visit. Don't leave the clinic until you get them. Think about the power of that. And so that's early on, and we don't have all the evaluation data from that, but, but we've got to engage patients as, as um, uh, co-builders of a good health system. Every service sector does it, right? But not healthcare. Okay. Um, and one, one more thing is, even though patients may not always get it right, 
um, you do see huge distinctions in how people uh, rate their own health system. And this is a variable, this is a, a really interesting question uh, that we call health system endorsement, saying, do you think your health system is essentially okay, just needs minor fixes? Does it need major reforms, or should we just start from scratch? Right? Those are the three options people are given. And I'm just, we've compiled data from every survey that ever asked that question. And just showing you by income, there are big distinctions. Again, it's not that everybody's complaining unnecessarily. People do get it when they're getting crappy care and crappy systems they can't rely on. All right. The USA, of course, is, yeah. All right. Error three. I, I don't want to keep picking on this country. All right. Um, error three is the proximity fallacy. The idea that um, the, the way the systems are most functional and most effective is when they are close to clients. The trouble with that idea is it assumes that, again, services that are provided close to clients can be done with good fidelity, with, with, with good quality, consistently, you know, uh, uh, in ways that, uh, that accord with those principles I laid out at the beginning, consistently, every day, good quality. The trouble is um, that cannot happen for many services, which are actually more advanced, require a team require a system, require rapid response. And one of those areas is delivery care, which I think has been mischaracterized globally as a low, as a low acuity need, right? Why? Because 90%, 95%, 85%, whoever, as number you'd like, of births are actually pretty routine. They're very dramatic, for sure, particularly for the mother. But uh, they're routine. They're routine clinically. Um, that, unfortunately, is not the, the, the bulk that actually deliveries that is harmful or kills women or babies. It's the other 15%. And the problem is we don't know which, 15, which women will be in that 15%. And so what we know in um, high-income countries, uh, from, from, from high-income countries, from low-income countries, is there are some basic features, medical features of birth, that actually should have very strong implications for the way uh, that health systems respond and, how, and where we deliver care. Complications arise unexpectedly. They do require advanced skills. Anybody here who has had a postpartum hemorrhage alone in a rural hospital, uh, like some of us, knows it's incredibly terrifying. It induces PTSD in the doctor uh, and is not something to, to, to be you know, dismissed as a, as a minor health service. Um, C-sections and blood banks in primary care in those, in those far away, in those um, um, uh, small clinics um, that are in the rural areas, they're not available. And referral, you know, this is like the thing that we've been banking on all the time. If quality is terrible, just refer. It's, it's a terrible idea. Nobody would refer a bleeding woman or a baby that's not breathing. That's the worst possible time for, for any colleagues here who work in emergency medical services and, and referral know that that's just the, the worst setup possible. So you don't, you don't want to refer. And the reality is referral doesn't really exist. It's only a thing in theory because there are no cars, ambulances, or fuel. Um, and so when we looked at uh, performance on delivery care across, uh, we tried to do a volume quality analysis. Uh, data are not quite the same as, as some of my health services research colleagues have here um, and to, to make these kinds of analyses possible. But we looked at annual delivery volume in healthcare facilities in five countries. And then a basic, basic, you should think of this as a floor measure of, of quality of care. And, um, and we saw, yeah, you know, there is an association between volume and quality. But what was most striking is when I uh, had my um, postdoc uh, color code these uh, circle these dots into primary and secondary facilities, and what you see here is that the bigger picture here, bigger story here, is not volume and quality, but rather that facilities that are red are doing better than the facilities that are blue, and the facilities that are red are hospitals. Um, and so, what we um, one of the provocative ideas in the commission, it's gotten a lot of debate is that we need to rethink our mental models, our service delivery models for some conditions. And that actually there are a number of conditions that need to go to the hospital, period. That women should not stop at their first level facility. <laughs> they should not do any of that. They should deliver at or near hospitals. With all of the considerations, um, of course, of over -medical, preventing over-medicalization, treating women humanely, all of that has to be worked in. It's not an immediate solution. Right? But that women should be in a place where they can get definitive care for themselves or their newborn within half an hour, just as the standard is in other parts of the world. Whereas all of those freed up clinics that no longer need nurse midwife teams and advanced delivery equipment, right, can now have the time and space to provide care for those, uh, uh, those patients with hypertension and diabetes that should be managed at that level. So a swap in the health system. Um, is it feasible? You think this is a pipe dream. Where does she get off making these crazy recommendations? This is completely counter to the way we've been building health systems. But we did some geographic analyses and found that in Kenya, big country, um, you know, with, with um, a very scattered population, 
Um, turns out that today, that's on the left, if you plot every delivery facility and women's travel distance through that facility, 92% uh, of women are living within two hours of a facility called the delivery facility. Um, and the average quality of care, uh, using that same um, quick index that I showed you, that short index, is 0.42. If tomorrow we banned all those women from going to primary care, but instead had them go to the hospital, um, two-hour access would decline to 90%. Now, of course, the mean travel time does go up um, for many women in rural areas, uh, but the average quality would be almost doubled. Um, so very simple analyses. We've done this for eight countries. It's harder in some countries than others. But uh, just to say that all that post-colonial network building um, and, and health system building and all those investments that, that have been made over the, over the years have contributed to great, uh, actually great networks of facilities. The quality of care in those needs work. But there are, there are the facilities there. Implementation is a lot of considerations, including boosting primary care, working on the demand side, access, and so on. I won't belabor this because I'm going to run out of time for all my errors. Um, the fourth error um, that we identified in the commission was this notion of tackling manifestations or symptoms and not the causes of poor quality. And this is very easy to understand cognitive error. So the idea is we see poor care at the interface between users and patients. I just showed you tons of data showing that providers don't give the right drug. They don't make the right diagnosis. They don't do enough for that patient. They don't spend enough time with the patient. So the human reaction to that is to tell them to do more, right? To give them maybe a, a poster on their clinic um, wall. And in, in, in recent days, in the last 10 years, is to give them an mHealth tool of some sort to remind them to do that. In fact, three quarters of the improvement efforts in the literature, quality improvement in primary care, has been at what we call the point of care level. So that would be the, the micro level, the user, the health worker, or the facility level. Um, and um, that's a lot of investment in that level of improvement, right? Supervision, training guidelines. All of it's meant to do one thing, change the behavior of providers. Now, I'm going to show you some data in a minute, but just for a second, how easy is it to change the behavior of patients? Right? Anybody in clinical care would probably say, not so easy. People in public health know that simply posters and, and exhortation to exercise have really not been the strongest interventions out there. And yet, we've put all our eggs in this basket on quality improvement in the health system. So we did a small study, uh, a retrospective uh, look at uh, providers in, this is representative national samples of uh, provider uh, performance, adherence to standards of care for antenatal care for sick child care, again, used, using observations. So the outcome variable here is from clinical observations, and the key variable of interest, the predictor, is having had training or supervision in the past six months, or both of those things. I, this is just the coefficients from those regressions, but just to summarize, uh, doing the most point of care support for that worker, giving them a training and supervising them very well, results in one to two additional clinical actions out of 20 to 40 actions. That's what we're buying for all of those short-term trainings. Okay. And you can see this in other studies as well. The Better Birth Study, an incredibly well done, very rigorous study of 163,000 mother-baby pairs in 120 facilities in Uttar Pradesh, India, saw a 31-point increase um, in adherence to the checklist. This is a coaching and checklist intervention. Um, and precisely no change in deaths or complications for mothers or newborns. So people will do, teach to the test. They will do what you tell them to do. It's just that the capacity for them to save a life in primary health centers without C-section, without having really any competence in dealing with complications, those scary things I talked about earlier, means that they're, they're uh, hindered from actually uh, having a health effect. Um, and just two studies in the last couple of months uh, finding that QI at the point of care, very well thought out, multifactorial QI, had uh, no uh, effect in two large trials, one in um, India, one in China on uh, uh, mortality following uh, acute coronary events. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to expand the solution space is our first point. Uh, we've got to go from thinking about micro solutions, about tweaking our intervention, tweaking the provider, exhorting, reminding, prodding the provider, to thinking about structural macro interventions, which I think have the power for much larger effect sizes, but are much, much slower to change. And of course, from an evaluation point of view, harder to attribute as well. But you know, if we think about how do we get to a reasonably high quality health system in San Francisco or Boston or the US or Canada or UK, um, we didn't do it through an app. We didn't do it through checklists. We didn't do it through supervision. We didn't do it through a QI program. There were no QI officers when these systems were built, right? We did it through 
an interconnected network, it's a complex system, right? A, a system that was pushing all agents, pointing all agendas toward the goal of high quality care. Through many, this is not an efficient system, I'm not claiming that. I'm just saying that all these pieces, selecting incredibly tough selection into med, med schools and nursing schools, the rigorous training, the fact that our physicians and nurses do not get to go out into unsupervised practice the moment they get their diploma. They're supervised for some years. Professional standards, regulations about who can do, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you name it, procedure, you know, who can do a bypass, what kind of facility can do that. None of those exist in low-income countries. Resources and tools, frankly, legal sanctions and malpractice. And then incentives, maybe at the margin. But incentives, performance-based financing, also very, very limited impact on this, on this uh, whole area. So no quick fixes. Um, so we're in the commission, we're calling for structural reforms. In particular, I already mentioned redesigning service delivery, um, which is reorganizing services to maximize health and not uh, proximity. Um, governing for quality, including learning systems and regulation of, 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 of both private, private and public sectors, igniting population demand for quality so that we can actually have a counterpoint, that we can have a, a point of feedback, true feedback from the population, and hugely important will be transformation of the health workforce. Uh, one thing we observed, and Julio Frank observed in a commission he led some years ago, is that medical and nursing education in low -income countries has not been reformed since it was first introduced. There's been no competency-based training reforms in many, many places. This has got to happen. Um, so the way forward, and I'm about to wrap up, I, I see my card, um, is at least in a couple of different areas. Obviously, there's so much to do. So for any of you thinking about where to direct your career, we got work. Um, but um, in terms of research, researchers, I think, have a huge job ahead. Um, we have, uh, are woefully behind in measurement, um, for sure, and improvement science. On measurement, what are the right measures of trust, patient experience, timeliness? How do we measure timeliness? How do we, how do we measure that? That's actually really tough. Um, care competence, effective coverage. How do we uh, update our facility surveys so they stop counting things in the cupboard and instead measure performance? Um, updating population surveys so we more, more, know more than just family planning um, you know, and, and immunization, but know about the range of conditions that people are suffering from. Do you know that our current population surveys do not even tell us where people got care? We do not know the usual source of care for a, for a respondent at the household. Therefore, we cannot link what happens to them with what the health system did. Just very simple things are missing right now in our global data architecture to understand these questions. Um, and then improvement science, I think there's just so much to do. We need to evaluate ways and pathways to implementing some of these um, uh, uh, universal actions, as well as studying much more uh, best performers in low resource settings. And implementation science here will be critical because clearly performance is context dependent. Um, development assistance, I think, has been a source of distraction in some cases by focusing so much at the last mile part of the health system, so much so that they failed to build up that strong platform that will support um, the care. And in particular, investing, I think, where development assistance does need to go is to invest in country institutions uh, that produce evidence that I understand how, that, that can run these analyses, um, support building global evidence around which kind of system transformations are required, support development of measures and, and public goods around um, surveys and measurement. Uh, include quality and tracking progress. An ongoing discussion I am having with colleagues at the WHO is what in the Universal Health Coverage Index is measuring quality right now? What, what, what in there is measuring quality? If you, if you look at that index, you'll see very little. Um, and then donor funding should be focused on these harder to build things, the universal actions, uh, even if that takes 10 years to show effect. Um, and I do think, just to end, that universal health coverage, just to come back to that, which is a huge priority for the World Bank, for the World Health Organization, all partners, both partners in our efforts, and as were many um, bilateral funders as well, um, it's a huge uh, a potential, I think, in a platform for reforming systems. Because one way to think about UHC is it's tinkering, right, largely reforming the financing function of healthcare, right? But financing has to come together with service delivery in order to produce the goods just like Thailand did it. When Thailand introduced UHC, it simultaneously invested hugely in the health system, in training, in putting uh, very, very skilled providers in rural hospitals. It did many things at the same time and was able to then 10 years later show under five mortality declines, huge mortality gains, right? 
simply putting money in financing, however well structured your insurance pool is, uh, is not going to cut it because that is an insurance scheme and not a health scheme. So it, I think it's going to be critically important to combine uh, financing reform with health system design reform. And I just, I'm, I've just put together a, a few graphics to show you that many countries are quite seriously pursuing UHC uh, and I think have the opportunity, and many of them are interested in thinking uh, about what to do next in this agenda. So I hope uh, you're all inspired to drop whatever you were doing yesterday and pick up uh, this new line of work. Uh, I'm delighted for your questions. Thank you. Do you want to stay, or just stay up here? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'll start us off. Thank you very much. It is, I'm ready to shift over. So yes. can we just meet you afterwards to sign okay. up? Yep, absolutely. Okay, great. I'm, I'm uh, fabulous. Um, a few years ago in this same colloquium, we had a debate about the relative merit of um, uh, <coughs> focusing on e extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Uh. So extrinsic, you set uh, you know, goals for things that have to happen, you, things that you can count readily. And you just tell people, as you alluded to uh, at one point in the talk, you know, do these things. Yeah. Um, intrinsic motivation, the strategy might be, first of all, uh, uh, to um, encourage the natural tendency of healthcare workers uh, to want to do good, because that is a natural tendency of, of particularly high level healthcare workers, but yes. in, in general for healthcare workers. Um, and then um, give them tools to uh, help them build their. Capability. Uh, you mentioned training and supervision. Those are, are good intrinsic motivation support pillars in my, in my view. So that my question is, what, what's the relative role of extrinsic okay. tools versus just building the, um, the commitment internal to healthcare workers to do the best thing, uh, including dealing with dangerous and life-threatening situations? Yeah. Such a great question, uh, and I think one that hasn't been sufficiently considered before the explosion of PBF, um, for example, uh, results-based financing or performance-based financing programs, which made some strong assumptions, right, about the fact that if you put some incentives, 10 or 15% of income or, or so, uh, onto health services, people will people will figure out how to do better. Um, what we find, and, and there's a large psychological literature on this, of course, Jim, that you're familiar with, I'm sure, too, that what happens when you give people, as, if you do nothing else, and you've got health workers uh, you know, going about their day, and tomorrow they're going to get 10% more if they do a number of things, what they're going to do, if they can understand the incentives, because by the way, that's another point. Sometimes they're so complicated, it's difficult to, to target. But, but uh, as economic agents, they will find the very easiest way to achieve achieve that. And what they'll do is the things that are cognitively the least demanding and that are the easiest for them to get others to help with. So what we see from RBF, um, from a lot of the RBF data, and we, we cite those data, we actually commissioned a separate analysis of all the RBF data that were available to us at the time of the writing uh, to, to essentially conclude that um, what happens is utilization goes up because those uh, health workers give a little bit of their extra money to, to community health agents who bring people into clinics, and they also end up doing more on a few simple tasks. Unfortunately, those simple tasks are, are, are not the ones that are going to make the difference in mortality. And so, and I think that's supported by other data that people just do the, 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 the most obvious thing. In fact, there is a threat, and we had a, a colleague from the UK who just published a wonderful study in the, in the journal about what happens when you remove incentives in the UK system, uh, performance-based incentives. Um, and the hardest tasks that, that, were, that were accomplished under those incentives immediately <laughs> go away. Or, I mean, there are measurement issues as well, of course, as soon as that happens, because you also measure what you're paid for. So who knows if it's do going on or if it's just being recorded. Um, so there are dangers to that. I think there is a, a simplicity uh, of, again, input-output relationships that's assumed. That's not true. And potentially, we have colleagues writing qualitative work about the, the, the trade-offs between the intrinsic or the, the crowding out between the intri intrinsic and the extrinsic. I think what I hear from my colleagues who are struggling on this question in countries who are running medical and nursing and midwifery colleges is that it really has to start with selecting people who, who really care about this and want to make this their life. Um, and now, how do you then build up a system that nourishes that will and that desire through medical training, through demanding excellence in post-medical, um, you know, supervi supervised education, and throughout the, the their time in the health system, um, that's harder to do. This idea that um, you presented uh, about and from Kenya that shows that you know not everything can be delivered at primary care facilities yeah. and 
uh, villages, and it makes sense to move certain things to you know, centers or districts that are more um, a tertiary level or secondary level. Um, do you think this idea is also, could be applied to entire small countries where one could argue that certain very complex interventions, it's, it's not cost effective or, or worth uh, trying to implement them in small countries and we should just send patients abroad, that ministries should actually invest money in sending patients, say, abroad for a liver transplant as opposed mm -hmm. to setting up a liver transplant program? I think that's already happening. There are a number of countries that have, as part of their benefit packages, to the extent they include something as expensive as liver transplant, but kidney and, and other more simple, maybe, um, transplants, simple, um, there already are those provisions um, in small countries to use the facilities of other countries. The example I give is much more routine, delivery care, right, that, that that's, yeah, every country needs to be providing that. But you're right, at the very far end of very expensive technology, uh, I do think it's already, it's already happening, what you're, what you're suggesting. And has there been any, any analysis of whether it's cost effective? I guess, I, I, you know, cost effectiveness, as, as all of this does, starts with the question of how much are countries willing to pay to begin with, right, um, for this. Ma in many countries, those decisions are made for a very small number of people who pass rigorous, you know, screenings and so on and, and still takes up a substantial amount of the budget. So those are, those are broader questions than simply saying, should we do liver transplant somewhere else or, or here? That's just even a, a, a straight-up budgeting question of whether we should do any, right? That's the bigger one. Other questions? Thoughts, comments? Please. Oh, great. If we think back to the question that Jim asked when Aditya was here um, at the very beginning, maybe you weren't there yet, but the question was, if we think about the private sector and what they would be doing yeah. here, how much more should we, be, we, should we be spending on the management, in this case, of quality? So if, if we were to think about just the narrow part of that, which is, what data should we be collecting on a routine basis? Mm. You can't imagine that Starbucks doesn't know um, what the quality of their coffee is in every single yep. of their unit, and you can't yep. imagine they don't know what the cost structure is in every yep. single uh, point of, of delivery. Um, wh what is it? Pick the example that yep. you just illustrated with delivery care. So where should we be, in your yeah. sense, yeah, yeah. that it's sort of prima facie evidence of incompetent management if you don't know this much about the quality of, of maternal care or mm -hmm. delivery care mm -hmm. in every facility that does delivery in your system? Yeah, great question. Um, this is what we mean by you need to install learning systems that really are learning. What we see, here, here's what we see. Um, we see a lot of isomorphic mimicry. By what I mean by that is a lot of systems that look like they should be providing that kind of information that you're just describing, but are providing garbage. Um, key performance indicators. There's an explosion of interest in in collecting little surveys from patients and and, and various data from uh, from hospitals in in even very resource poor settings. When we look at those data, and we do, we did for this commission, we find excellent performance in most places at all times. Um, so what we need to do is we need to delink data from the very strong hierarchical incentives that exist in those systems. That's the first question. Give the management actually some latitude and some space to be able to learn and fail as well. So that um, uh, sub-maximal performance is not uh, you know, harshly penalized, but is actually uh, examined and learned from. One of the, I'll just give you an example of something that I think is incredibly simple. And we're, we want to test the validity of it, because I think every intervention needs to justify itself <laughs> uh, in, in the context of these very strained systems. Uh, it, measurement intervention, I'm even thinking. There's a huge load of measurement that we, uh, we want to actually reduce through, through these approaches. So, you know, the um, um, feedback buttons, the happy or not uh, sort of buttons that exist in every airport and so on, um, you know, putting those in clinics to get real-time data on people who exit um, could be very interesting. It, it should show you, right, potentially time trends during the day when pro providers are not attending to patients. Now, before we do that, I wouldn't want to put those in every clinic in, in Ethiopia or Kenya or anywhere else without knowing what do those buttons tell us. Are people able to really answer freely in the, you know, what's the right setting? So there's definitely implementation science and development work to be done. But th there is data that's real time, right, actionable, that, that managers can readily see. Um, when I was shown the demonstration of these systems, we could literally follow in real time the feedback from Geneva Airport, you know, at any moment in, in the day. And you can see the, the fluctuations throughout the day and the services that people are getting. So that's one piece 
I'm even more interested in mortality, <laughs> right? And perioperative, uh, perinatal mortality is trackable. We've shown it in many places. But what we've done is we've, in, we've invested in hugely disseminated health information systems, which collect many, many things. I would like to streamline that and really focus on the few signals of quality that, that matter most. Um, and I think those can be collected with, uh, with some regularity and, and, and um, uh, accuracy. Um, things like deaths are not that hard to get right if you've got the right measures in place. Dean. Uh, wonderful talk, as usual, Margaret. Um, I was particularly intrigued by your discussion of avoidable mortality and your division of avoidable mortality into preventable and treatably uh, avoidable. Yeah. Um, if I'm understanding the Commission's work, it's basically on the treaty, um, treatable avoidable, right. basically on clinical medicine. Right. I wonder if there's value, potentially, in a parallel line of work on understanding the sources of um, prevention, preventable yeah. mortality, and what can be done about that. Yeah. Dean, I think you're the second, I've given versions of this talk quite a few times since the commission, you're the second person and all the questions he's ever asked me about that. And my husband is grateful, he's a social epidemiologist. So he, all this health system stuff with him is like palliative care. He cares about that left part, part of the pie. Um, so I think that's right. It would be really, in, we didn't do it is the tr because our focus was very much about what's the health system's function and role, but it would be really interesting to see. It, it was a very simple, uh, there are different ways to do it. Uh, our colleagues at IHME apply um, risk, sort of different risk models um, to extract the, these, these um, uh, excess deaths. We just applied something simpler and I think more transparent, which is to say if there was excess incidents, that's to us failure of prevention. Uh, Incidence prevalence, depending on your condition, um, and so yeah, that is the um, that would be really interesting to look at by condition, right? Because presumably the condition-specific data would tell us if it's road injuries, that's one set of interventions. If it's uh, cardiovascular disease, it's another. Um, so yeah, I agree that's a really worthwhile area of work. We haven't we haven't pursued it, but the data are freely available to anyone who would like to look, and we're happy to share. Thank you very much, Margaret. It was, oh, it was a very exciting talk. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I just wanted to know whether you could tell us a little bit about what the commissioners are actually doing in their own countries as a follow-on to the, this commission. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. I didn't have time to get into the most exciting, because I know all this stuff. The most exciting stuff to me now that I wanted to, happy to share is, What's, what's been the reaction, what's happening in countries? Um, so we had all those um, commissioners from all, all parts of the world, and in fact, eight national commissions formed themselves with minimal um, support from the Global Commission and examined these data in their own contexts. Uh, South Africa just put together a, a high quality health systems report from its national commission. I would say that uh, the, the, there are a couple of themes that countries have been really um, eager to pursue. One is um, the idea that as they're formulating their next generation health strategies, they would like to measure differently. They, they're relatively convinced about uh, this notion that what's measured right now is not the most meaningful set of measures and maybe not even so great at gauging um, uh, performance or return on investment, which is what the health ministers are very eager to demonstrate to their finance ministers. Um, so the idea of showing performance, the idea of adjusting coverage by the quality of the coverage, the effective coverage measures, many countries are eager to do that and, and some have undertaken their own analyses. Colleagues in Ethiopia are independently publishing effective coverage estimates across the country now. So that's really exciting. I, I think politically, um, we've had a number of politicians in the commission as well who say to us that the way to, uh, to support this agenda in, in countries is to make clear that this is a, this is a, a political win uh, for countries that can, that can get it right, that can invest in aspects of the health system that people value, that are aligned also with uh, better health goal achievement. Um, our, we have a, the member of parliament for Kathmandu from Nepal, the former minister of health. We have ministers of health have political appointees, and they always think in these political cycles. So it's been very helpful to hear from them. And many of them are saying UHC is this opportunity because it's our moment. I think in Kenya, universal health coverage, is uh, the president calls it one of his big three. The big three things, you know, they're going to work on employment, they're going to work on education, and, and universal health coverage. So that has caught the imagination 
of many countries. And now I think many of the commissioners are working with their governments to say, right, how do we make sure that this set of reforms truly addresses quality? Because if not, right, even if we cover services entirely, perfectly and efficiently, people won't use them. And if they, they use them, they won't get better. There's just not a winning situation to address financing alone. So I think that's been the biggest probably area for, for policy development um, in the country since the launch. Thank you. Very much. Thank